Father, we thank Thee for this song, Only to Believe. Just see our Lord as He come to the boy that had the epilepsy, said, I can if you believe, for all things are possible to them that believe. Lord, help our unbelief tonight is our prayer. We are so thankful to You for Your presence with us and for people who believe You and love You, and to know now not we will be, but now we are lifted up in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, sitting by with our King tonight, already seated positionally with Him. Oh, how we thank Thee for this confidence that we have in Him, His promises, knowing that it can never fail, that it's always true. We pray that You'll visit with us tonight. May the Holy Spirit take the Word of God and divide it to our hearts just as we have need. Uh, when we leave tonight going to our homes, we might say with those who come from Emmaus one night saying, Did not our hearts burn within us as He talked to us along the way? For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We be seated. I am very happy to be back again tonight to speak to you and fellowship with you around the things that belongs to Christ. That's no other purpose we have of being here but to do that. Just fellowship around his word. I'm sorry I keep you all so late each night. Someone told me, said, people go home here at 8.30 and 9 o'clock from church. But uh, I'm, a, I'm just a southerner and kind of slow, you know, and I can't think of it so fast. I just have to kind of uh, take uh, my time with it. But uh, I certainly am thankful for the fine cooperation that I get from you people in there who are believing on God. Uh, your, your fine cooperation makes it so easy to, for the Holy Spirit to move among the people. I wish I could find this everywhere. <laughs> uh, I do. Where you could find people who believe, no matter what God does, how much of a gift He'd represent, you have to believe it. Amen. Because it's ineffective unless you believe it. Jesus one time, coming from another country, came into his own, and they said, We heard you did so and so at such place. But then he could not do many mighty works. Now, we don't like to say it that way, but that's the way the Scripture says it, that he could, do, he could not do many mighty works because of their unbelief. And God's power is limited to your faith in it. That's the only limit it has is your faith. If all things are possible to them that will believe it. There's a great God in heaven. And if we can only get in contact like a direct line to him, all things are possible. Right. But we must come in contact with him. With no static, no word, just a clear channel between us and God. Then he said, if you say to this mountain, be moved. And don't doubt in your heart, but believe that what you have said. Now, you can't bluff it. Satan doesn't bluff too easy. So you can't bluff it, but when you really know it, then it's got to happen. See, it's just, it must happen. So we're here and worship him, and he's lovely and fairest of in thousands as to our soul. And we're certainly happy to be seated here with you tonight in this lovely time of fellowship. Now, you that like to read the word or mark the places, I thought tonight, been preaching so much on divine healing, I kind of changed the subject tonight a little bit. Not exactly change it, but just um, the running of it. Because you can't change one word in the Bible because it just 
coincides with the other words with it. All Scripture just binds together. It's just like a, a pardon if this sounds sacrilegious, and I wouldn't mean it that way at all, but um, it's just like a jigsaw puzzle. You know, we used to get the old jigsaw puzzles all uh, cut up, up, and then we'd sit down and study how to, to put it together. And then we'd have to have something laying over on the side, the picture of what we were trying to place together to make the jigsaw puzzle come out right. If you didn't, you'd, have, you'd never get it done. And now, that's the way the Scripture is. It's cut up like that to be hid from the eyes of the wise and prudent. See? They're like the Pharisees, smart scholars. Jesus thanked God that it, uh, he hid that from their eyes. And will reveal it to babes such as will learn. Now, if you want your example to lay aside your pattern to see what the Scripture goes together with, just lay Jesus over here and go to watching Him and placing it in the Bible. you got the whole thing come out right because it is the revelation Amen. of Jesus Christ. Oh, yes. oh, New Testament and Old both all speak of Jesus. They, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, because He is the, this book of redemption. He was the Word and He is the Word and that's bound to be Him, you see. So this is the whole book of redemption which is Jesus Christ fitly put together by God Amen. with the promises of redemption and healing and everything for the human being. Amen. See? Do you get that now? Amen. This book is Jesus Christ put together by God. See? And He come as a human being and redeemed us and every promise is in Him and for you. So he is the Redeemer. Let us turn tonight in the Old Testament to get what we wish to make a context from as we read from Isaiah, the sixth chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah. Uh, like Isaiah's writings, he was a great prophet. Did you ever know that Isaiah wrote the entire Bible and uh, like a prelude to it? He did. Isaiah starts out in the creation, in the middle of the book comes John the Baptist, and the last in the millennium. So, he, the 66 books of the Bible and 66 chapters of Isaiah. So, it's uh, just uh, certainly a foreshadow of the entire Bible. Now, let us read from the sixth chapter. In the year that Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting uh, upon a throne, high lifted up. And his train filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. And with twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sins are purged. Also I heard the voice of God, the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send? And whom shall, or who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Yeah. I wish to... Uh, take a text, if we should call it that, on the subject of influence. Influence is a great thing. We are told of Scripture that we are written epistles and read of all man. And we as Christians should always watch what we do and what we say that we're perfectly honest to every man. And you, if you can't be honest with your fellow man, you certainly won't be honest with God. Amen. So how we serve God is that we serve each other. As honest as I'd be with you, that's as honest as I'll be with God. Amen. And that's the same way with you to me. We must be honest with each other in all of our dealings. And somebody is watching us. You may not think that, but there's eyes watching you. And your life is influencing somebody. Maybe it's a little child. 
And that child may grow up to be a, another Fanny or Moody or so forth. We don't know. But uh, your, your life is influencing someone. And our setting tonight is quite a great setting on this because just reading it this afternoon when I was studying, I was thinking how great God was this morning when my son and I were kind of walking around this, the block. There was so many people. We went out around Times Square for they said they were going to tear it down. I think the, the work's already begun. So I was looking at that. We were taking some pictures and the people crowding. I said to my son, Billy, I said, where are they all going? What's the hurry? Here they are down beneath us running. You're running up above us running. I said, Where's everybody going? In such a hurry. And as we stood, we thought this, how can God know the thoughts of every person? And how could it be that all the the billions in the earth, and yet God knows every time you bat your eye. He's infinite. And if you just want to know, and just to satisfy that, if it ever comes in your mind, Go out and look up at the stars and wonder how he controls all of those. Amen. Then you'll see what a little job this would be. Amen. When those stars, you can see 120 million years of light space through a glass. You know how fast tra- light travels. Why, you could run a row of nines around the state of New York. Couldn't break it down in miles. And beyond that, it's just as many stars as there is on this side. There Mount Palmer and Mount Wilson there in California, it may be seen. Think how great he is and how he holds the earth. This earth or one of those stars would move from its place millions and billions of miles away. It would affect this earth. That whole solar system has to stay just at its place. And see, everything God made like that obeys God. But when God made man, man seems to want to know more than he does, you see. It's, we're the only ones out of place. They stay in place and they have to stay in place to coordinate with each other. For instance, the moon. If the moon would ever move out of its place, the earth would be filled with water in a few moments. See, the, the moon is, is rather like a, a watchdog of the sea. It set its bounds that it can't pass. And when the moon turns from the earth, here comes the tides in. If the moon didn't catch it around the other side, it would cover the earth. See, so uh, uh, the moon stops and, and he turns his back to look around the other side of the world and and uh, here comes the water's coming in real fast, and then he turns again. He's Jehovah's servant. Sea stops and goes back to its place again because it sees the perfect moving of Jehovah. Oh, if we in the church as the members of the body of Christ could only work in harmony like that, you'd see a great, mighty church of the living God all in one array filled with the Holy Spirit. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Every member of the body functioning just exactly to its place. Every gift to its place. Every gift helping the other. Every member helping the other. That would be wonderful. That's what we want to see. But we'll see it someday. And it would be right. Now, this young fellow, uh, Uzziah, was a king. But before he became king, he was a king during the reign of of Isaiah the prophet. And uh, he was a shepherd boy. He liked the outdoors. He was a great influence on, on Isaiah's life. Isaiah was a young fellow also, just a young prophet. And you read the story, if you want to take Second Chronicles 26, it'll tell you how that um, at the age of 16, after the death of his righteous father, he became, they taken him and made him king over Israel. At the age of 16, he began to reign. And he had seen the influence of his uh, parents. His mother was a godly woman. And uh, his father was a godly man before him. And in that, it put the influence in the child to do that which was right. I tell you, I think today we have such a juvenile a crime wave across the nation. But really, I think it started in the home. Uh, I think the parents began to let go. And if the child had been raised up in a good old-fashioned godly home, I don't say it would be uh, all over. Certainly not. But it would certainly give that child the right kind of influence. I think many times that homes that children have been brought up 
wrong, turn loose on the street and just live for themselves while the mother stays in a bar room or the, uh, and the father and so forth and they don't take care of this child. Another thing, they don't love it and give it the affections to take it up. It's young. You've got to teach it to love and respect and to read the Bible. I think of Suzanne Wesley. I think she had 17 children. I think that's right. But she found two hours or more every day to pray. Down at the uh, end of her dress where the little boys knelt around out there produced a John and a Charles that changed the course of the world, saved the world in that day. And she didn't have a wash machine and a dryer as we have today and a dishwasher and so forth or made the thing that she did it all herself, but yet she could find time because she was putting an influence to some children that finally changed the course of the world. I think that's the old-fashioned mother, the old-fashioned home, where prayer and the understanding of the Bible, means Abraham Lincoln never owned a book in his life till he was of age, but the Bible, and I think it was either the Fox Book of Martyrs, I might I might been... Uh, another book, I think it was Pilgrim Progress to be right, it was Pilgrim Progress and, and the Bible. You see what kind of a character that molded? Just let me go in your house and see what kind of pictures you got on your wall. Let me go to your home or your office and let's see what kind of music's playing. Okay? What you read, what you look at, I can pretty well tell you what's on the inside of you, see, because it feeds on that. See? And all to a home, if we made a home more lovely, children wouldn't want to run away, make things more for them, where they feel welcome and nice and comfortable at home, where home they can't only wait till they get there. And that's the way home should be. And I think that's the kind of a home that Uzziah must have been raised in because of the influence of his godly uh, parents. And as soon as he become king... He ignored all popular opinions and uh, all political uh, differences. And he set his mind for one thing. He had served God regardless. We need some more politicians like that. Uh, he, he was determined that he was going to serve God because that's the way he was raised. And his father gave him the right influence that he, he could serve God and live. And his kingdom was so great till I believe it was next to Solomon's kingdom. I believe it's noted about next to Solomon's kingdom. How God blessed him. And this was a great influence upon this young prophet, Isaiah, who was at the temple at the time or in the land. And uh, how he was uh, uh, seen and how God would bless a man that taken the right stand, done the right thing, had the right motive and the right objective, and he done right. Sometimes you may think that it doesn't pay off, but it certainly does pay off. Amen. It's got to pay off. You cannot be going east and west at the same time. You can't be going right and left at the same time. You may think you're going the other way, but you're not. So if you'll set your, your mind and eyes and uh, motives and objectives and life on the right thing, you've got to come out on the right thing. You can't Amen. fail. See? That's the only way, no matter how much you're tempted to do the other side, turn your head from it and do what's right. And you're, you know you're right. You feel better. And you are better. <laughs> and that's just all there is to it. You got, you're going to come out right. If you start going west, you're not, you're not going to be going north. You're going to be going, you're going to be going west. And that's the same way it is in right and wrong. And Isaiah saw this. And he saw that God blessed him and how he, all the nations around about his fame went plumb into Egypt. How the nations didn't want war with him, they, they seen that God was with him, so he just, uh, they sent in peace offerings and herds of sheep and things and, and give it to him uh, to cause peace. And he was a good man. And I believe if a nation or a people or a church or an individual, no matter how much the critics criticize you, just do the right thing. They have a respect for you. Way down in their heart, I found that to be the truth. Amen. Be honest. Be upright. People will respect that. Amen. And uh, even though they're wrong, they still respect it, you see, because it's, it's just a human being. We're all human, and we, we know that it is right and wrong, and we must take that. Way. And, and Uzziah helped this standard. He was a great influence, as I've said, to Isaiah the prophet. And then 
Uzziah made that fatal mistake just like many other people do. When he got, felt secure, felt that he just had the whole thing in his hand, he got lifted up in his spirit. He got lifted up to pride. Now, there's a real example for us all. You know, that's been the trouble. I'm, I'm speaking to Christians and, and ministers, and I, I want to be honest about these things. And just, that's where many ministers even make a mistake. We've heard so many times about uh, the ministers, uh, the acts that they do, and, and the things, some of them maybe to doing things they should not do. I think sometimes them are good men, a wonderful Christians that's been used of the Lord, and then finally they get a little kingdom built around them, or a lot of influence, many people attending their meetings, until they get careless. And they get kind of lifted up. The people applaud them and stand up. And, and uh, we, we shouldn't really do that. We Remember, we're just all, there's no big people among us. Amen. We're all just God's children, you see. Amen. If God made some of us one thing and some another, why, well, he may be with a finger and an eye and so forth. Well, uh, we got to appreciate each other. Amen. And not try to feel big because we're all connected together to one God. Amen. See? And we all come off of one tree. Mm-hmm. And now we find that many times ministers get the feeling just a little secure. And uh, they keep leading out. And the first thing you know, they'll do things that they should not do. Amen. And we know that many times righteous and good men will get so that they'll have too many uh, social affairs. Just uh, They want to go out to big parties and the first thing you know, they'll call for a little drink once in a while, and they get a tangle with the world. And uh, I think that's what's the matter with our churches today. I think that's what's the matter with our Pentecostal move. Now, let me state this first clearly. See? You hear me say things about the Pentecostal church, and I am Pentecostal. See? But here, what if there was no Pentecostal people in New York tonight? Where would I go to preach this message to? See? I appreciate the Pentecostal people. They're my brothers and sisters. But yet, when I see something wrong with my brother, my child, or uh, be my wife, or whatever it was, right is right. A correct parent will correct their children. And I think that the trouble with our church, we try to get too much like the the others. Uh, We try to act like somebody else, you see. and, And we begin to take on their habits. And the first thing you know, it used to be... uh. I don't remember the Pentecostal people in their beginning. Of course, they been many years ago. This last move from Azusa Street. But I took the history of it. And I, I've read many books and talked to some of the old men. Fixing to have a meeting right now with one at Shreveport, Louisiana. He'll be there. Was one of the first men in Azusa Street. And then, that's the beginning of Pentecost in this country. About 50-something years ago, I suppose. I preached the Golden Jubilee at the McPherson Temple... Nancy's Temple in Los Angeles a few years ago, the Golden Jubilee, uh, the 50th year, uh, Pentecost. Now, you see, but since then, there's been so many little things creep into the church. Because the church has to rub shoulders with the world each day. Now, as I don't mean to, to come back to this again, to, the, to our sisters, see, our brothers. Many times, it used to be years ago, it, it was wrong for, as I said tonight, for our sisters to cut their hair. It used to be a, a Pentecostal affair that they shouldn't do that. Amen. And they were saying, but what is it? Now we go into the different parts of the country, and we find the, uh, the, our Pentecostal sisters with those waterhead haircuts, you know, them the big uh, haircuts like that. And you can tell them about it, and they use makeup, they, they wear clothes like men. And you say, now, Brother Branham, you're picking on the women. Now, wait a minute, let me pick on the man, the, the brother, that'll let his wife do that. <laughs> He's not a much ruler over his house. See, see, uh, see, you shouldn't do that. But what is it? We've rubbed shoulders with the rest of them. Some little weakling come in from some seminary or school and have a different idea of it. But there's only one perfect example that's right back to the Bible. Amen. The Bible condemns that, see, Amen. and it's not right. And then we find other things. It used to be it was wrong for uh, holiness people to, to attend bioscopes or movies, you know. Now they go all the time, see. 
And then Satan pulled a faster on it, put the television right in your house and, and fixed it in there. But all these things that it used to be wrong. Well, what is it? See, it comes in so gradual until the first thing you know, it's a scotch. It's like a vine growing around you. Now, if you keep that vine away from you, see, and just keep wrapped around Jesus, Hallelujah. around the Word, Amen. and stay with that, see, you'll grow straight. Amen. That's crooked. And it pulls you off the road. Christ pulls you up. Amen. That pulls you sideways. Amen. And then you see one woman, like a minister's wife or a minister, start doing a certain thing. His whole church will say, well, our pastor does it. The pastor's wife does it. Why shouldn't we do this? See, you are influencing someone and be sure that you're influencing them right. Amen. Towards the right road. And the things to do that's right. Now, we find out when you get lifted up, right then you're on your road down. Amen. See, when you lift yourself up. And we find out that this uh, Uzziah, he got lifted up because he felt secure. All, everything around him, he... He had his uh, uh, nation and it was well taken care of and God had blessed him and he had great vineyards and herds and sheep and, and mines and everything wealthy and all the nations was at peace with him. So he, he just got lifted up so he thought he could just do anything that he, he wished to and pride. He got so lifted up until he tried to take a minister's place. He went into the temple and took uh, the uh, censer and went to the altar. And when he did, the priest ran after him and told him he shouldn't do that. And when he was corrected, instead of being humble as he would have been before he was lifted up, he just said, that is right, I have no, no right to do this. And it set the censer down and handed it to the priest who was of uh, Aaron, ordained to do so, only consecrated for that service. I uh, travel uh, quite a bit with the, they say, full gospel businessman, many of them are sitting right here now. And I've got to speak at their breakfast uh, Saturday, Saturday morning at somewhat Statler Hotel, I believe it is. They said they already uh, sold 1,700 tickets for the breakfast already. So they, um, uh, uh, not long ago, I was speaking with them and they taking the businessman up on the platform, taking the text and preaching the gospel. I said, that's wrong. It certainly is wrong. It's hard enough for us preachers to keep it straight, let alone take a businessman who's not ordained to something like that. That you bring in little ideas and so forth. And I said, you shouldn't do that. Don't never try to take the other fellow's place. God made you a certain thing and you stay that. You stay just what you are. Don't try to impersonate the other. That's what always ruins our, the gifts that God sends to the world. We find so many carnal impersonations. And we find someone who tries to copy after the other. And like I said, as the lady minister, so Mrs. McPherson was living... And every woman minister wore those wings of that she did or what it was and had their Bible the same way and everything that she did, they did. We notice we got so many Billy Grahams today. But you see, God never made but one Billy Graham. That's all. He, and you're just as important as Billy Graham or Roberts or any of those famous men. You're just as important. Until you get out of your place. Amen. And then you're no good at all. You, you're, you're hinders to, to these men and you're hinders to yourself in the kingdom of God. Amen. Stay in your position. See? Stay what God made you. See? And then you'll operate right. It's Paul that's not nothing new. Paul taught the same thing. He said, the hand shall say to the eye because I'm not the eye or the ear say to the nose. I, I'll no more be an ear because I'm not the nose or something. You, you can't do that. See, it all... Fitly sets together and moves as one great unit. And um, we mustn't try to impersonate anyone. Just be what you are. Mm -hmm. And that's the way God made you. You never fashioned yourself. And remember, as much as we ministers would like to take Billy Graham's place, we cannot do it. Neither can Billy Graham take our place. Mm -hmm. We each one has something to do. The common little fellow here that may be a janitor... The little woman that may be a housewife, the greatest minister on the face of the earth today, could not take your place. You, God had a purpose in making you what you are. And you just serve God in that way that He made you. Now, I think if we just do that, the wheels would roll a lot easier. <laughs> yes, it would if we would do that. Now, I get lifted up. And we find out instead of when someone tells someone something scripturally, and we see that it's right, instead of 
of trying to humble ourselves to say, well, now, I, I've been wrong. You forgive me. And I, I didn't mean, I didn't, I didn't know that. So I just quit doing that. Well, then, instead of doing that, too many times we do like Uzziah did. He felt like he was too big to be called down. Yeah. See? He was a king. Yeah. And many times I've seen uh, ministers that way. They felt that they were just too important to be told what the work was true. Well, the days of miracles are past. I can show you where God ordained miracles. Now, you can't tell me where he ever took it away. See? And he ordained gifts. You never did see where he took it away. See? Uh, it's in the Scripture. Go ye into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. Yeah. How long? To all the world. To every creature hears it. Amen. As many as hears it. These signs shall follow them that believe. See? Yeah. We can't substitute something else. Just take what he said. And it'll be all right. And it'll work fine. But as long as we try to adopt our own ways. That's where Israel made their most rational mistake. When grace had provided them a pillar of fire, angel, a sacrifice, and delivered them, sent them a prophet, sent them a pillar of fire to follow them, to lead the prophet in the way. And when they come to Exodus, the 19th chapter, when they swapped grace for law, they did the most rational thing they ever did. But they wanted something that they could do themselves. That's the way we are. We got to have our doctor's degree. And if you haven't got it, you can't get in church. That's all. So, and... Uh, we must study the thing and find out whether it's of God. Now, we find out Uzziah got lifted up. And he didn't go to do it anyhow. He grabbed up the censer and took off. And it make a difference what the priest said he was going in anyhow. And it was against the scripture. It was unscriptural for him to do that. Amen. It's unscriptural for your eye to impersonate anyone else. Amen. Right. So be what you are and be a good one. And fulfill your purpose so others can see it. If you're a housewife, be a real one. <laughs> see? If you're a, a husband, be a genuine. See? And if you're a deacon, be a, a genuine or a preacher, whatever you are. But don't try to take someone else's place. And then when the Word calls you down on this, don't, if you do feel rebuked, then repent. Amen. That's all. Yes. Get right. That's the only thing to do. But Uzziah didn't want to do that. After God had blessed him the way he had, and yet... He didn't feel like that he would do that. He felt he was going to go on and do it anyhow because he felt he was secure. But while he was in the... It kind of made him feel angry at those men too that was telling him the word of the Lord. And when he did, he rushed in anyhow and we find out that in his face come leprosy. And he was a leper until he died. He had never could go to the house of the Lord no more. He died a leper. After he had seen the hand of God and how God had been so good to him and done the things he had, yet that man died isolated leper. Now we can do that. We've seen many things, but don't you never think that we're so secure that God can't put judgment up on us. Amen. Amen. Remember, don't try to impersonate anyone else. Be just what you are. If God made you a Pentecostal, you'd be a real one, you see. If, if God... But don't be ashamed of it. Amen. I'm not ashamed to be a human being. I'm not ashamed to be an American. I'm, I'm not ashamed to be a minister. I'm not ashamed of the gospel that I preach. Because I know many of them thinking I've lost my mind. Even my good old righteous mother that died a few years ago, when I first received the Holy Ghost, there was no one in our country know anything about it. And I was just a local, little young Baptist preacher, about 20 years old. But when I received the Holy Ghost, my mother said, that boy has lost his mind, see? But no matter what mother thought, I had found a, a pearl of great price. It might seem like that to her, but to me, it was real, see? It was, it was a genuine something that I would found in God because I always believed as a boy that this was the Word of God and it could never change. Jesus said, heavens and earth will pass away, but my word shall never be changed. It shall never pass away. You can't a, a substitute anything to it. It's just the way it's written, and that's the way we believe it. Don't add nothing or take nothing from it. You know, over in the book of the Revelation, it said, whosoever shall add a word or take anything out of this book, what the curse would be up on him. So just stay it just the way it is and believe it like that, and God will honor him. Now, he was smitten... Uh, because of his uplifting of pride, got the feeling that there was, he was the only one there was, and uh, he'd do what he wished to, and nobody else could stop him. 
We had a brother not long ago that I felt so sorry for him. Looked like everybody got out and accused the brother of doing something wrong, which uh, the newspaper accused it. But I, I got to thinking about that. Accused the man, and I really took up for him because I, I certainly didn't agree with him, but the man who uh, wrote an article and put it in a magazine that this man had said all these different things and done these things, and one night at a meeting in, in uh, Minneapolis, they told me that the writer of this magazine was there, and the article had just come through in the Christian uh, magazine, so I, uh, as a Christian Digest, so I knew, they pointed the man out to me and said, that's him sitting there. And, and uh, he had in this article that uh, this minister had uh, wrote something, a book, that the man did not write. I know a lady wrote that book, and I knew the lady, uh, Biting of Devils. So I, I said, um, well, now, one thing that I would say, now, I might disagree with the minister, but I think if the, if the editor of this column, if he never checked his script no better than to say that this man wrote this article, and I know he did not do it, See, then I'm afraid a lot more things he said about this minister is wrong. And then I said this, I would rather be found even wrong but trying to get somebody saved than trying to hinder somebody that's trying to get somebody saved. So I'd rather really take the man's place at any time than try to criticize or tear down what somebody else was building up even though they had made an error done something wrong. So we must watch, we influence others on what we do. Then when this man got stricken by this leprosy when he got lifted up in pride. This was a great lesson to that young prophet. He found out by this being a great lesson to him that God orders his man to the place. See? Man cannot order himself. God orders his man. God makes you what you are. See? And God orders his man. And he must try to take another's place. And it was a lesson to Isaiah that he mustn't put his eyes upon human beings. For an example, he must put his eyes on God. Amen. Now, that's us. Any man, any man is subject to mistakes. Amen. He's subject to error because he's human. He's subject to the violations of God's laws. And he's subject to many things because Satan tempts him. And he's just a human being. And if God ever lifted his hands, it'd fall. That's all. Amen. And um, I've heard people say, oh, Satan can't do me. Yes, you just let God lift his hand one time and watch what happens. It's, uh, I constantly plead, God, no, don't send him. Uh, have mercy on me. Keep him away from me, you see. Uh, I need God's mercy. Amen. And we all need that. Amen. Now we find that Isaiah, he leaned heavy upon the good king's arm. And now the arm had been taken from him. And the king was dead and died with leprosy in shame. Now, Isaiah, uh, during this time, the king being lifted up, well, then his young son was to take the place, and we find out that if the people had got into a, a horrible, immoral stage, when there's no real godly leader, then the people begin to get into immorals. I think that's what's the matter with us today in our nation, in our churches and things. We need godly leaders, somebody that sets an example. And, um, but he let Isaiah know here that she could not uh, look upon man. So Isaiah, one day, as he wandered around, he must have got all weary, being noticed he had a great responsibility. He went down to the temple to pray. Now, that's a good thing to do for all of us. He goes down to the temple to pray. And we notice when he was praying down at the altar, all at once being a prophet, he fell into a vision. And when he did, he looked up and he saw God, the King, sitting way high, exalted up on his throne, and his train filled the place. As he did. Then he saw a real example. He saw one that he could put his confidence in that could never be stricken with leprosy, one that could never fail. In other words, he was saying to Isaiah, see, you put your hope in some man, and it failed. You put your uh, look to this man for an example, and, and he failed. Now look up here at me. I'm the unfailing God. I, I think that's what uh, we should do today. Amen. As his servants should look to him. Jesus is our example. And we must look to him, the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. Now, uh, we find out in this vision 
that he saw God lifted up high on a throne. Then he noticed another thing. Note, around him was, and in the temple where he was at, was these heavenly seraphims. If you check that word, I think it's only used about once or twice in the Bible. And it's, it's not cherubims, but it's next to cherubims, something like an angelic being. And yet it is an angel, it, it is an angel. But it's a special person. What they are, they're a burner of sacrifice in the Bible. And what the sacrifice, of course, uh, brings in or leads in the, uh, makes a way for the sinner to holiness. And these uh, seraphims burning the sacrifice, which was required, they, they went to, uh, that was their duty. And here they were, uh, uh, flying through the temple, uh, while Isaiah was in the vision, and the whole temple become full of smoke. And um, they were crying one to the other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Hallelujah. Holy, holy, holy. Oh. In other words, there's something that cannot fall. There's your example. There's the king to look to. Amen. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And we find out that these were six-winged creatures. And now we're going to study their reason for having six wings. They had, um, we find out they had two over their face, two over their feet, and were flying with two wings. Now, notice first that these creatures were ministering in the presence of God. And that was their duty, was crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And they cried day and night in His presence as the sacrifice is laying there. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And I want you to notice something here and think. Those seraphims had two wings over their faces. Why would they put them over their faces? Because they were in the presence of God. Amen. And just think, if holy angels have to cover their face in His presence, Amen. what about us? Amen. Has the wings over their faces represented reverence? Amen. But today we find that there's no reverence. Hardly you can find reverence. They don't have no respect for God. They stand and say, God bless America with their foot on the bar. And uh, it's terrible the way they do. I went to ask for a, a sandwich today in a, in a place. And the little lady, not making no remarks about her, but I thought she is dying. She looked like she cankered under her eyes. She had blue all around her, and she ran up uh, just a few clothes on, and she said, what do you have? I said, would you bring me a sandwich and a, 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 a glass of buttermilk? And she said, bourbon on something, some guy. I said, no, ma'am. You misunderstood me. I said, I said, buttermilk. And she said, oh, I said, won't you have something to drink? I said, I want buttermilk. And she said, uh, well, you are, don't you want to, now we serve so-and-so? I said, I'm a minister. She said, well, our, uh, well, our Catholic priest come in here and drink. I said, I I'm not a Catholic priest, lady. I, I, want, I want a glass of buttermilk. It seemed like it shocked the woman. She didn't know what it was. See? And the world has got into such a place. Now, if a priest comes in and drink, the congregation's got a right to drink. There's an example, see? Oh, my, what a corruption we're living in. We need a house cleaning all the way from the pulpit. To the... Now, yes, sir, we certainly do. How the corruption uh, of the world and these, no reverence, no respects. The people today, they don't respect God. They have no reverence. They take His name in vain and tell dirty jokes and and even ministers do that. You hear a, a joke, I guess, would be all right, but uh, ministers should be examples, I think, of what of, of righteousness and holiness. And uh, that's the reason I think maybe we uh, we don't get no farther than we do. We not don't come the the sincerity that we ought to have in it. When you're carrying on and going on, you lose that little grain of sincerity. You know, there's something about it. You must remember that God is watching you every hour. He watches you when you're asleep. I, I think the reason that people uh, do those things is because they, um, they're, they're, they're not conscious of His presence. 
See, but yeah, he's there where you think he is or not. Amen. He sees every look that you make and every, every move that you make. He knows all about it. But we ought to realize that. We used to have a little song when I first come among the Pentecostals. They sing, all along on the road to the soul's true abode, there's an eye watching you. Every step that you take, this great eye is awake, there's an eye watching you. You see? You remember the song? Yeah. Now, that is true. God's omnipresence knows what you're doing and even your thoughts. One time while I was in a vision, I was speaking to a being standing by me. And he said back, he said, your thoughts are louder in the heavens than your voice is on the earth. Amen. He knows what you're thinking. You might say you, uh, you do this and you do that and... It, uh, but, you see, down in your heart, if you think different, you're, you're doing something wrong. You should be just what you are. See? The, the heart, the mouth should speak what's in the heart. See? And so, we find that the people doesn't realize the, the presence of God. You know, they ought to be like David, the, the man that was after God's own heart. He said, the Lord is always before me. Wherever he goes, he remembers God is always before him. He is on my right hand, and I'll not be moved, uh, because God is on his right hand. Reverence. We are to honor one another, respect one another, as brother, sister, and love one another with undying love. You say, well, I just can't, well, I'll just stay here a little longer. <laughs> and uh, you will like people, too. You'll love those who doesn't love you. That's really a good sign of Christianity when you can, from your heart, Love those who does not love you. Amen. Love the unlovable. Jesus said, if you just do favors to those that do favors for you, well, the publicans do the same thing. Amen. But see, you must be kind to those who are unkind to you. Amen. Do good for those that would do evil to you. Always remember that. Keep that before you, that God's watching you. Remember, God was good to you when you were evil to Him. Amen. While you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. Amen. Now, we find out that these wings over their faces was because they were in the presence of God, reverent. And if a holy seraphim has to hide his face behind special covering, the one who knows no sin, never sin, but yet in the presence of the holy God has to hide his holy face in the presence of God, what is a hypocrite going to do on that day? What's the backslider going to do on that day? What's the ungodly going to do on that day? When you come in, you're going to have to face him. Amen. And there's only one thing. You say, but he never made me wings to cover my face, but he sp shed the blood of his own son that you could cover your face with. That's right. That's his only covering that he has for the human race is the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, secondly, they had their uh, feet covered with wings under their feet. Now, that represented humility. Oh, there's a word that's lost today to many people. Humility in His presence. Humble ourselves in His presence. I've seen the Holy Spirit come into the room and, uh, and perform and do just exactly the things that the Bible said He would do. Discern. And I've seen people get up and walk out. I've seen people sit and talk and laugh and make fun of it while it was going on. I remember one night a minister brought 28 of his congregation and was sitting, this was at Jonesboro, Arkansas. And um, uh, they had an epileptic boy that's having uh, epilepsy and it, it, that's a devil. It's a devil, that's what it is. They don't, doctors don't know what does it. It's a, it's a devil. And, uh, and they put a, had a clothespin with a... Uh, a uh, rag wrapped around it. When it had these fists, they threw it in the boy's mouth because he would chew his tongue so. And they brought the boy up and, and uh, he was having this uh, fit right on the platform because when they get the least bit excited, they'll go into one. So while we were fixing to pray for the boy, I said, will everyone bow their heads in reverence? And I, I prayed for him and uh, the spirit would not leave the boy. And I looked around and I seen a little group sitting in a place. I said, uh, uh, would you bow your head? I said, you must uh, obey. I said, that was commission. If you can get the people to believe you and then be sincere when you pray. I said, would you bow your head? And that fellow just laughed at me. And so I turned around, but this, it would not leave the boy. And now this is hundreds of people, five times of what's sitting here tonight, sitting there. Yes, many times. 
the claim is 28,000 people there. So, so there was, there was, um, there's all, uh, and then I said, uh, I, I wouldn't do that, sir. And he belonged to a, a denomination church that just simply laughed at divine healing, doesn't believe there is such a thing. So I looked around, that poor boy is thrown out, his mother trying to hold her, crying like that. And the boy is uh, trying to swallow and going on. And I said, Heavenly Father, don't let this innocent boy have to suffer for that guilty group. Thing. I said, uh, that was your, your word. And I, I've been honest and told them, and so many of the epileptics has been healed here at the meeting. I said, don't let this innocent boy have to suffer. The mother and father brought him here. I pray for mercy. And then I turned and I said, uh, 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 in the name of the Lord Jesus, uh, by faith, by my commission given to me by Almighty God, Amen. Uh, this devil cannot hold this boy. You're at liberty. See, if the disobedient will be disobedient, then you're at liberty to go to him. But come out of that boy. And I saw 28 people with their pastor fall into epilepsy right around and around and around and around in the floor like that. And as far as I know, they still got it. See? Now, you see, you must be irreverent. You must humble yourself. How many of you have been in meetings and seen similar things happen in my meetings? Just why I said, sure, yes, sir. One time they brought a man to hypnotize me. I guess many of you remember that. And they, they take him out to army camps and take these soldiers and hypnotize them and make a bark like a dog. And they're going to have some fun out of me. So I was in an auditorium and they uh, brought this man and, and I felt one of the prayer lines started the evil spirit somewhere. You can always pick them in that doubt. They think they don't. It was, you, you know, it's different. So then I could tell where it was at, but I couldn't see just where the man was. After a while I found it and I seen what it was. I watched that darkness hanging over And I didn't want to say that. But it's turned around to him and said, Child of the devil. See? Why has the devil put in your mind to do that? Because he's done that. Something was saying it in me. They'll pack you out of here. And he's still paralyzed. <laughs> letter after letter. Come to him. I said, You only thing I know is repent. See, I never did that. That was your irreverence before God. See? Now, don't you do that. We're, we sometimes, people think that this holiness before God is just uh, some kind of a mockery. There's some kind of a, a bunch of people who doesn't know uh, some kind of a cult or a clan or something. But let me assure you, brother, there may be a lot of mockery. I, I don't say there isn't. I, I, I can't say that. I'm just a man. I need to judge. I'm just to preach. But there is a genuine Holy Spirit. Amen. Genuine Amen. apostolic power Amen. of the Holy Spirit in our in foreign countries and witch doctors and things rise up and devils to challenge all oh, we just got break my subject here to go telling you about those things. And what the Holy Spirit never one time have ever seen him fail to do it. Amen. He'll do it every Amen. time. Amen. Notice now they put had wings over their feet for humility. We don't like to bow ourselves. We want to think that we're somebody. I remember here not long ago, I was in a little uh, a museum and, and they had the, uh, the analysis of a man weighing 150 pounds, what his body was worth in chemicals. I believe it was 84 cents. Uh, a man weighing 150 pounds, his, his chemicals of his body, he had some calcium and uh, a little enough whitewash maybe to sprinkle a hen's nest and so forth. Just That's about all he... He had in him weighing 184 pounds. I mean, uh, 84 cents weighing 150 pounds. There's two young men standing there looking at this, and I was standing right behind him. As uh, one of them said, "Well," I said, "John, we're not worth very much after all, are we?" And he said, "I guess we're not." And I said, "Well, boys, that is true. See, you're not worth very much in chemicals, but you got a soul inside of you. Amen. It's worth a million worlds. See, Amen. that's right. Amen. See." But yet, we, we want to take care, we get the pride in this 84 cents, wrap it up in a $500 meat coat and, and a thicker nose up there and think we're, we're doing something. I don't mean to be a joking. This is not to joke. This, this is just telling you what we are. Amen. We're, 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 we haven't got the humility. We don't want to, and people don't, uh, you go to sometimes a real well-dressed people in church, they, they'll come in, if you're not dressed just right, they'll look at you and talk, you know, and you make, it's, they shouldn't do that in professing Christianity. I, I, I think it's just a profession and, and not a possession. Because I believe that a, a real old-time experience with God 
will make a tuxedo coat, put his arms around a pair of overhauls and say, Brother, I, I really believe it. It's a true, a calico dress with a silk one will call sister. Yes, sir. Because it isn't the clothes, it isn't the person. It's Christ. What's on the inside? And we should humble ourselves. Now, we find out that it's, uh, these angels covered their feet of these seraphims. Moses, when he was in the presence of God, that, watch him, above that pillar of fire that was back in that burning bush, the Lord spoke out and anyone knows that pillar of fire was Christ. <laughs> He was the angel of the covenant. Amen. Moses forsook Egypt, esteemed the reproach of Christ greater treasures than that of Egypt. Amen. So it was the angel of the covenant. And when he appeared in that burning bush by the side of, well, in front of Moses, and the voice said, Take off your shoes, Amen. your feet, see. Take off your shoes, for the ground that you stand on is holy. Hallelujah. Moses humbled himself by taking off his shoes. That same pillar of fire appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus one day. You remember Jesus when he was on earth, they said, one day they said, uh, they was at St. John 6, they were drinking the, from the fountain and rejoicing, and he said, uh, uh, I am that water that comes from that rock. I am the bread of life that come out of heaven, you see, like that. They couldn't believe it. They said, why, here we know you have a devil and you're mad. It means crazy. Because you're not over 50 years old. And you said you saw Abraham? He said, before Abraham was, I am. I am. Now, we see that, that Jesus said, I come from God. I go to God. When this pillar of fire was made flesh, God coming from the fatherhood, friendship. And when he come into this attribute, the three attributes, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, when God became manifested in flesh, he said, I come from God. I go to God. Amen. And he ascended up. And, and Saul of Tarsus, on his road down to Damascus, he was stricken down by a light. And when he did, he looked up. And that Jew would have never called anything Lord if it hadn't been that pillar of fire. He saw that light there. And he said, Lord, who are you? He said, Saul, it's hard for you to kick against the prick. And he said, who are you? Lord. He said, I'm Jesus. <laughs> See? The pillar of fire again. Look at Saul humble himself in the dirt. See? In the presence of God. Humility. Struck off of his feet, laying on his back, perhaps looking up. And that pillar of fire moving around there, and he saw and knew as a teacher from under Gamaliel, the great teacher of that day, he knew that God had led his people in a form of a pillar of fire, and that fire, pillar of fire had been made flesh and dwelt among them, and had been crucified for their sins, and I come from God and go back to God. And here he was, still in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then we find then in that Later, just before that, John the Baptist, the greatest of all the prophets, all the prophets spoke of him coming. John said, this is him. He, in, he introduced him to the world. And John, standing there in the water, when he's baptizing, and he, he's saying there's coming a time when the daily sacrifice will be taken from the temple, and there'll be a man be a sacrifice. And John was sure that he was going to see Messiah. You see, when John was called, his father was a priest. But usually a boy followed in them days and during the Orient yet the occupation of his father. And ordinarily he would have been a priest, but John never went to the school. Because John was born from his mother's womb, full of the Holy Ghost. When Elizabeth had conceived and the baby was dead in her womb, when Mary was visited by the angel Gabriel and told her that her cousin Elizabeth, who is past barren, but also conceived in Mary, run up to meet her, and she'd hid herself, and she was wearied because the baby hadn't moved for six months, and that's subnormal. And um, so she seen Mary come, and she run out and met her and hugged her, and she said, um, begin to talk, and, and she said, I know she's going to be mother. She said, yes, and um, I, I'm going to be mother too. Oh, I guess you and Joseph are married. No, no, we're not married yet. And you're going to be mother. Yeah. The Holy Ghost overshadowed me. 
and said that holy thing that would be born of me in me would be the Son of God and I should call his name Jesus. Amen. And just as soon as that word Jesus was spoke the first time from a human lip, a baby that had never been had life in it yet received life in its mother's wombs and began to jump for joy. Amen. And if the name of Jesus Christ will bring life to a dead baby, what ought it to do to a born again church that claims to be filled with the Holy Ghost? Now, what kind of a boy should this be? He was to announce the coming Messiah. Malachi 3 said he would. Behold, I send my messenger before my face. Now, if he'd went down to the seminary, some of those ministers down there said, Now, John, you're to announce the Messiah. Why, you, you know that Uncle Joe here, or, or uh, Father Jim, or some of them, you know he's got all the, 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 the qualities of being the Messiah. That's him, John. Uh, uh, see, he'd been influenced by man. He went into the wilderness. And he stayed with God. That's the best seminary I know of. Because his job was too important for some man to be telling him, taking him out to big social affairs. He, he had a, a work. He was cut out for something. And John knew that when he came out preaching that the Messiah was on earth then. Just as sure as them wise men knew when they looked down from Babylon and seen them three stars in line, that was a sign the Messiah was already on earth. That's the reason they were crying, where is he's born king of the Jews? And the church didn't have the answer. They haven't got it today. The Bible's what's got it. God's word's what's got it. Right. We find out that, all, that John had to announce the Messiah. And he, had, he only would know that Messiah by a sign. Amen. That's how I know Messiah. That's the only way God ever makes Himself known. Amen. By a scriptural sign. Amen. And he watched. He stood out there. He said, they said, are you the Messiah? He said, no, I'm not even worthy to touch his shoes. He said, but he's one. There's one standing among you. Oh, my. Don't think I'm excited. I know where I am. No, but it just feels good when I get to thinking about that. There's one among you. I say that tonight. There's one among you. Amen. The great Holy Spirit promised to be poured out of the last days. I see his sign constantly. And I know he's the Messiah. Because he still does the Messiah sign. There he stood among them. He said, there's one among you. I'm not worthy to touch his shoes, to unlatch his shoes. He's the one that will baptize with the Holy Ghost and fire. And one day, walking from out of the midst, come an ordinary man. Yeah. Walked out. John looked up and said, Behold, there's a Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And when he did, he stole. He said, I knew him because he was a sign following him. And watch here. There's two of the greatest men on earth. Standing face to face. John, I remember Dr. Roy Davis that ordained me in the Missionary Baptist Church. He said, You know what happened there? Billy said, What happened? When John said, I have need to be baptized of thee, and why well, come a sign to me? What's the humility of John? He said, I, I have need to be baptized of thee. Why well, come thou unto me? There was a Messiah and his prophet. Amen. The keynotes of the day, the keynotes of the Bible. Amen. Standing there, one looking at the other. John in humility. That I have need to be baptized of thee. Why well, come a sign to me? Jesus said, Suffer that to be so, for thus it is the coming to us to fulfill all righteousness. Amen. And said, John suffered him. I remember Dr. Davis, you might be sitting present. Dr. Davis not throwing it at you. But I, 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 he said, John, first Jesus baptized John because John hadn't been baptized. And then said, Then John baptized Jesus. That never did just come right to me. So one day, while the Holy Spirit was near and in a vision, I saw what it was. There was John and Jesus standing. Face to face, the prophet to whom the word come to, and the word had come to the prophet. <laughs> Amen. And he said, Suffer it to be so. It was right. Suffer. But thus it is becoming to us to fulfill all righteousness. The prophet knew that that was the lamb, and the lamb must be washed before it's presented. Amen. <laughs> so he did. See that? The prophet being the word that it had come to him.
านจอห์น the prophet the word comes to his prophet and the word comes exactly to the prophet it is becoming it says behoveth which means becoming to us that we fulfill all righteousness Oh, how I could leave the text now for a minute. How it's becoming to us to fulfill all righteousness. Amen. The hour is here. Amen. Something we must fulfill all righteousness. Amen. We know what to do. See, we should do it. That's Amen. right. Believe with all of our heart. Notice, then we find that John humbled himself in the presence of God. The thing of it is, people, my brother, sister, and friends, is to be conscious of your littleness. See? Don't be conscious of how big you are. Be conscious of how little you are. You're, you're small. We're all that way. Amen. God can do without us, but we can't do without Him. See? See? We, we can't do without Him, but He can't do without us. Amen. God's only trying to find one person He can get in His hands. He's always tried to do that. You notice all down through the Bible, when He found an Isaiah, when He found a Jeremiah, then he found, he found Samson one day. But Samson gave his strength to God, but he gave his heart to Delilah. See, he, you've got to give your all to God. Your reverence, your respect, your, everything that you are, just be nothing. Just see how little you are. And that's what God wants us to do. And that's real uh, humility. That's where these seraphims are in His presence, you see. With their face and reverence covered, their feet in humility. Now, thirdly, they could fly. They had two wings. That put them in action. God has shown His prophet here... What kind of a servant he has prepared? River, humble, and in action. <laughs> that, see, that's a real servant of God. These who look upon him, he was looking upon Hezekiah that got lifted up and fell by pride. But a servant, uh, his servants and before him is river, humble, and in action. His servants, that's the way they should be dressed. Dressed in reverence. Humility and constantly about the Father's business. Amen. Yes, sir. Reverend humble in action. Just like the little woman we spoke of the other night at the well. Now she is a little predestinated seed laying in her heart. But as soon as that light flashed up on there and she seen that was the Messiah, it didn't take her long to go in action. Amen. She even forgot the water pot that she had in her hand. That's how quick she went into action. She had to tell the people. She had to tell somebody else. Because that she was sure that she had found the Messiah. Into the city she went, and quickly she went into action telling people. It was uh, Peter, when he was fished all night, and was sitting on the bank that morning when Jesus barred his boat. And it uh, thrust out a little from the bank and was uh, uh, preaching to the people. And then he said to Simon, uh, launch out into the deep and let down for the drop. Let down. Uh, uh, Simon said, uh, I'm a fisherman. <laughs> I know when the moon and signs are right. I know when the fish is running. I, I, I've born on this lake here. I've fished all night and haven't tucked uh, even a minute. I haven't taken a thing. said, there's no fish in there. But at thy word. Amen. There you are. I'll lay down the net. Oh, you might, we can't figure these things out. You, God's past figuring out. You've got to believe it. Okay? God is known not by knowledge, not by education. He's known by faith and faith only. At thy word, I know there's no fish there, but thy word, if you said let down this fish there, you faith will put it there, that's all. I'll let down the net. If people sitting here that's sick and, and needs help from God, if you say, I've been through every prayer line, I, I've done everything, but at thy word, I'm going to let down the net. I'm coming right now, and I'm going to receive it. I believe I'm in his presence. And, I'm, and recognize that with humility and sincerity and reverence, let down the net. Take a hold of it. God said so, and it, that makes it so. And we find out as soon as he, being a fisherman, and know what it was to, to catch a good a shipload of fish, and he was a poor man. But quickly he went in action when Jesus said, From henceforth you'll catch man. It didn't take him very long. He humbled himself, fell down before Christ, said, Depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. He said, I, I, I just can't uh, stay in your presence. The same thing Isaiah did. He said, I'm a man of sinful lips. I dwell among sinful people. Oh, what a condition he was in. Peter said the same thing. And he humbled himself, got out on his face, and asked the Lord to depart from him. He said, Fear not, Peter, from henceforth you are going to catch man. 
And he got in action right quick. One time there was a blind man that Jesus healed. It didn't take him very long to go in action. He went in action spreading his fame everywhere. Someone come up and said, Why, uh, who healed you? The priest did. He, he said, told him who healed him. First he asked the father and mother. And the mother said, Well, now they're afraid because if, if anybody confessed Jesus, why, well, they was going to put him out of synagogue. And they put him back onto their poor son. They said, He's of age. Ask him. And he said, One Jesus of Nazareth heal me. He said, Well, give God praise. He said, uh, We... We are. We don't know nothing about this Jesus of Nazareth. Said he's a sinner. Uh, well, don't give him no praise. Give it all to God. And I, we don't know whence he come. Well, this blind man had a very good question for him. Yeah. He said, "It's a mighty strange thing that you all are the spiritual leaders today, and this man opened my blinded eyes. I was born blind, and yet you don't know where he come from." Amen. Now that's a strange thing. Could I say the same thing? The very God that promised to come up on His church in this last days and. They haven't got the answer. The one who receives has got the answer. Amen. So whether it's a sinner or not, I can't say that. But one thing I know, where I was once blind, I can now see. Oh, once I was a sinner, I'm saved by the grace of God. I know something happened to me. Huh? If something happened, you can call it holy roller, or you can call it whatever you wish you, but it saved me. Thirty some odd years ago, and it gets better all the time. So I, I enjoy it. Someone said, you done gone crazy. I said, then leave me alone. I'm better off this way than it was the other way. So just let me say the way I am. I feel better this way and doing better. I do more. Yes, sir. He went in action right away. Yes, sir. He spread his fame everywhere. The people at Pentecost, as soon as they seen that God kept his promise, Jesus said, behold, I'll send the promise, the scripture, the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye, that's wait. Wait up at the city of Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. Not the first prayer line or the first time through, but just stay there until it happens, see. Until. Not one day, two days, or ten years. Just until it happens. Stay until. And when they was filled with the Holy Spirit, they went into action right quick. Out into the streets and screaming and dancing and acting like drunk people and speaking in other tongues. and What a carry-on. They was in action right quick. As soon as they humbled themselves, went in and closed the door and waited on the Word of God. Oh, what we've seen, friends, I know it's getting late and I don't want to keep you any longer. But look, what we have seen in the, in the last few years ought to put every one of us into action. It ought to put us in action. What first make us reverent, humble, and in action, and love, burning in our hearts. Trying our best to see a lost world and seeing the signs that God, even down as far as I know, to the very last one that the church is going to receive before the fire falls from heaven. The same pillar of fire Amen. that was seen back there in the wilderness, the same one that struck St. Paul down, is the same one even God's picture taken everything. Right here doing the same thing it did there. Amen. Same Messiah. If you put the life of a pumpkin vine into a watermelon vine, it would bear pumpkins. If you put the life of a grapevine into a, a, a pear tree, it would bear grapes. Because it's a life that's in it. And if this is what we see and know, thousands around the world knows it. Science has testified to it. Everywhere the pictures is taken. It's right here now. Amen. That is true. Amen. So true. It's right here now. And if it don't bear the same kind of life it did when it was in the person Christ Jesus, if it doesn't do the same thing in His church, then it's wrong. But if it bears the same life, it's got to be the same pillar of fire. But that is Israel. It's leading us to the promised land. In my Father's house is many mansions. The promise that He gave us. And it leads us there. And we see it fully vindicated. God's Word made manifest. The lame walks. The deaf hears. The blind sees. The dead's raised up. The thoughts of the heart cannot be hid. It's called right out. The very works that He did. What is it? Some man? It's the Messiah. It's the Messiah of God. The Holy Spirit. Same one. Why ought to put the Pentecostal church instead of trying to criticize it? It ought to be an action. Everywhere with humility and love. Trying to say it to a lost and dying people. We should
should respect Him. We should love Him. Humble ourselves. Make ourselves reverent and be in action like these seraphims was with reverence and humility. Vindicated clearly. Promised to us in the last days and here it is. Amen. We see it. Jesus said so. He said it would happen. Here it is. Amen. Just before it will be burnt up. That sign of His coming proves that the coming is right at hand now. Amen. It could come at any time. I don't see nothing to hinder the rapture of the church right now. Well, the mark, well, the mark of the beast is on the other side, remember, see? The apostasy. It comes in at the church. Now, wait, I, maybe I might have said something. That's my way of saying it, see? Um, watch. Word by word is already fulfilled. It should put us in action. That's exactly right. We should be getting every lost soul to the kingdom of God that we can. But because one of these days, you go to bring them, it won't do no good. The door will be closed. There'll be no more. Oh, they may be mentally worked up and excited and shout and jump up and down and claim this, you know, but when the sleeping virgin comes to buy oil, she never got it. Amen. And did you ever see a time in all the history of these last days that there was a time that the Presbyterians, Lutherans, everything else is trying to come to the Pentecostal message? What did Jesus say? While they come to buy, it was a time that the bride went in. The wise virgin went in. They did not get the oil. And they didn't get it. That's all. That's according to the scripture. And you see these signs and these other things. Everything's sitting right in order for his coming. The seventh watch, he come in. Some fellows see the first watch, second, third, fourth, fifth. And then the seventh watch, there come a cry, behold, the bridegroom coming. The seventh church age, that's the watch, the age, it watched it. And this is the lady I'll see at church age at the end of it. Amen. 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 Oh, and say, wow. Won't you wake these saints to the Lord while I slumber when the end is near? But remember, the church and the lady of sin ages to get lukewarm. He said, because you say uh, uh, that you're rich and, and you're increased in goods, and said you don't know that you're naked, blind, poor, miserable, and don't know it. Amen. said, I'll skew you from my mouth. And here we are at the end of all things, end of history. End of civilization. You can see, look out on the street. I was talking to the cab drivers, bring me over. He said, well, the only way I can tell when I see a man around here acting sane, I know he's a stranger. <laughs> uh, that's why your cab driver said that. Said, Wait. It's just not only here, but it's everywhere. The end of everything. How cruel man and all kind of wicked things and, and, and they're doing. The world is perverted. Look out on the streets. Just look at it. Oh, my Everywhere. Not only in America, everywhere. Why, it's a, it's a modern Sodom. There's nothing to be left but burn up. Amen. That's all. It'll be cleaned off. God will do it. His law is required. It's got to be done that way. When a corn stalk has lived its life out, it's got to be destroyed. When a flower lives its life out, it's got to die. And civilization has lived its time out. The church age lived it out. The denominations lived it out. Amen. This is a uniting time. This is a united nation, united church, and united efforts. What is the sign of Christ and His bride uniting? That's what it is. It's all shadows and types. Everything wants to be unionized. So it's a sign. Christ is fixing to unite with His bride. A wedding supper taking place in the sky. So it ought to throw the church into action when we see the signs of His sure at hand. Oh, my. All these things are signs to us everywhere. Oh, we should be in action. We like the prophet of old, Isaiah. We see what self-exalted man come to. We see what these organizations that rise up and say, well, because you don't belong to us, you're not even in it. We see what happens to them. What do they lose? Just like they're stricken with sinful leprosy, with unbelief. They, they lose their hold on the Word of God. Some of these people try, they exchange, lose their hold on the word and swap it for creeds. Amen. What do they get themselves? A mess of leprosy. Amen. That's right. Like Uzziah of old, trying to take the place of a non in office. And I haven't got nothing but a doctor's degree or something. Amen. God ain't looking for a doctor's degree. Amen. He's looking for humble hearts. Amen. Somebody that'll believe him. Amen. But we have tucked man and educated him to bishops and everything else, cardinals and what more. 
educate them enough to hold a divine office with an education of carnality. We need the baptism of the Holy Ghost to take that office. The Holy Ghost is our tutor. He's the one that makes himself known among us. The sign of the hour, the last days. But we, like Hezekiah, exalted up. They can think they can take their places. Look what the effects of the vision did to the prophet. Now, he was a prophet. He was a vessel for the word of the Lord to come to. He was chosen, born a prophet. Amen. Finally gave his life, sawed up to pieces with a saw. But we find out that this great prophet, when he saw this vision from heaven and saw the order, how God was preparing his man, why it caused the prophet to confess that he was a sinner. If we want to be so big and wear some kind of a big turnaround collar, some kind of a clothes, you know, it makes us look so holy and reverent. There's no holiness with us. We can't be holy. Yeah. Holiness is of God. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly, it ain't a holy church. It ain't a holy mountain. It's a holy God. Yeah. That's right. Not holy people, a holy God. Yeah. It's God in the people. Yeah. Peter referred to the Mount Transfiguration, a holy mount. It meant the holy God was on the mountain. Yeah. Look at it now, see? But it was the Holy God there. The presence of God what made it holy. Amen. It's the presence of God in our midst now that brings holiness. Not my holiness, not yours, but His holiness. God brings our holiness. We are to humble ourselves, cover ourselves, reverence, humility, and say, Lord Jesus, bring me into your kingdom. His holiness, not ours. Holy Spirit, the prophet confessed Caused him to say, I'm a man of unclean lips. A prophet. God, we need another vision like that. Amen. When he saw up there, uh, the, saw this cleansing power of God. Now watch how God did. He sent one of the, the seraphims and took the tongue, took a hot coal off the altar, put it in his hands, come laid Isaiah's head back and touched his lips, said, your iniquity's gone. Then Isaiah learned another lesson. I might drop this in. <laughs> might not be very appropriate, but I believe it is. <laughs> Did you notice? God cleanses his prophets by fire, not by theology or a book of some kind. Yeah. He, he cleans his people by fire. Yeah. Holy Ghost in fire. Yeah. Not by yeah. declaration of creeds or books or something. You've got to learn a bunch of prayers and so forth. He cleans them by fire yeah. off of the altar. That's how he sets him in order. Yes. yes, sir. That's how he cleansed his prophets at the beginning. When 120 was in an upper room, the Holy Ghost fell and tongues of fire set upon them. They were cleansed and ready for service. That's how God cleans, not by learning, get a Bachelor of Art or DD, PhD, but getting holy fire from heaven that takes the lying off your lips and takes the carnality out of you. Burns that stuff away, that dross of, of the world, and puts his presence in there and lives to that person. Holy fire is what God cleans his church with. Isaiah learned that. We ought to learn it. That God don't cleanse by knowledge, he cleans by fire. You see how his prophet set in order. Now he cleansed his lips, took his iniquity away. Then, after he had, he had confessed, Humbled himself. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips. When he saw the presence of God. Do you follow me? Amen. What, do we, what do we know right now? We're in the presence of God. We believe. We believe. That's right. We are right now sitting. You, you can, we can't comprehend it. But we are now in the presence of God. Seeing God. Believe. You believe he's here? Certainly yeah. he's here. Yeah. We must. I'm your brother. Yeah. But he said, the works that I do shall he all, you do also. Is that what he said? Yeah. All right. If he's here, his spirit's here. That's what makes him. Then if we can surrender ourselves and get our own thoughts away just like this has no thoughts, then another voice can speak to it. That's why if we can empty ourselves out. There's the secret. Get rid of yourself. Then God gets. Get rid of your own thinking. Get rid of your own ways. Then let God move. If He's Jesus Christ the same yesterday and forever, you believe it? 
You believe him right now and see if it is. I've been watching this little fellow sitting here, right here in front of me. You don't have a prayer card, you. If God will tell me what you're sitting there for, you believe it? It's a spiritual problem. You're all wound up. You don't know what to do. If that's right, raise up your hand. All right, it's all over. Take the word what I said. It's all over. You believe that? That colored lady sitting right back there looking over at him. Got heart trouble. Do you believe that God will make you well? Sure. You believe, all right, you can have your healing. You believe he's the same yesterday? That man, that white man with his hand up. You believe me to be God's prophet, his servant? I don't know you. You're a stranger to me. You have a prayer card or anything? Just a man sitting here. All right, sir, you got a tumor in your throat. That is right. Is that right? You believe me to be his prophet? You believe me with all your heart? You got, another, you got a burden on your heart. It's about a little girl, your grandchild. She's got a bad hand. That's right. Is that true? There's a good connection. Just a minute. You're not from here. You're from Connecticut. And your name is Wilson. Your first name's Art. Art Wilson. That's exactly right. Is that true? You believe it? There's a lady sitting right back here, a colored lady. Look out. Got a, something like a yellow coat on. Yeah, chartreuse, green. She's praying. Got a prayer card? Yeah, you got a prayer card. You haven't. You believe me to be a servant? I'm a total stranger. We're two races of people. You, but you're praying. That's you. Yes. You believe that God can tell me your trouble? You got a tumor. That's right. You got something on your heart too. You're praying. It's a friend. You got kidney trouble. That's right. Raise up your hand. All right. Now you can have your request. I challenge your faith. What is it? When the prophet saw that he was in the presence of God, he humbled himself. Look. First he humbled himself. Then the fire cleansed him. And after the fire cleansed him, then it was a cleansed Isaiah. When he heard the voice of God said, Who will go for me? He went into action. Here am I. Send me. Oh, my. When the coal of fire had touched the prophet, making him as pure as pure could be, when the voice of God said, Who will go for us? Then he answered, Master, here am I. Send me. Amen. That was a call to clean Isaiah. After the Holy Ghost had cleaned him, he didn't need any seminary experiences. He didn't need any book experiences. He had been cleansed by the fire of God. He called into action. What was it? When he seen God in action. He went in action. We see God in action. The power for the church to get the action. And the examples of what God is. Do you believe that? How many wants to confess all your wrongs and everything now and say, God, cleanse me? He ain't a young man. When the coal of fire touched the prophet, let's stand to our feet. I'll stop right here. It's getting late. Believe with all your heart now. I want you to bow your heads. Remember, after he saw God, there it is again. Amen. Now anything can happen. Anything can happen. When the coal of fire had touched the prophet, of making him as pure as pure could be. Oh, when the voice of God said, Who will Then he answered, Man, I send me. Speak, my Lord. Raise your hands.
Let's place our hands over our heart. While we're humming, make your confession. Say, Lord, I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm a woman of unclean lips. Let's have a real confession. We'll have a real revival. First be cleansed. Watch the prophet had to be cleansed first. The fire touched him. Then he was in action. Lord, give me a zeal in my heart. Place something in me I haven't got, Lord. Put your love and fire me. Now make your confession. Believe God with all your heart. Speak, my Lord. Speak, my Lord. Speak to your heart now, real humbly, sweetly, reverently, in His presence. Every sinner, every saint, this is for all of us. It's for me. It's for all. Here's His presence. He's here. What He said He would do. The sign that He said we would get. Here He is. While the music's playing sweetly, let's just confess our wrong. I'm not nothing anyhow, Lord. Speak to my heart. Cleanse me first, Lord. Send the Holy Ghost and cleanse me. I know I'm in your presence. I see you as Isaiah saw you moving. The place is full of, not smoke now, it's full of light, full of glory. Oh, Lord God, creator of heavens and earth. As this is on our mind. We see what happens to high exalted people. They were all examples to us. We see what humility and prayer to the saved means. I pray, Heavenly Father, just now... For this audience and for myself, Lord, take from me anything that's not like you. I, I, I want you to live in me, Lord. I want your spirit with the, with the preeminence. I, I want you to live so completely in me that I'm no more myself. And I, I just walk and talk and live in you. Grant it, Lord. Here am I. Cleanse me, Lord. Cleanse this church. Cleanse us all together. Take sickness. Take sin. Take unbelief. Take doubt. Take it all out. Let the Holy Ghost come out with a coal of fire from the altar. A new spark of Pentecost. And cleanse every heart in here. Take us, Lord. We are yours. We believe you. Grant it, Father. Speak, my Lord. Speak and I. and will and have consecrated your lives to Christ anew. Right now, I want to consecrate yourself in His presence. If I start calling what I've seen, I'd you'd take everybody in here, I believe, right now. I know you. No, I wouldn't stand here and say that as a servant of Christ. Well, it's just everywhere. You're in a condition right now to start a new Pentecost. It, it certainly is true, friend. Just humble yourself. Cover your face. Cover your feet. Cover, just get uh, close to Him. Bow down. And make your confession. And believe. Do you want to do that? Yeah. If you do, just raise up your hands while we sing, Speak, my Lord. Speak, my Lord. Pray now. 